Hi, I'm Steph, and I'm going to talk about mobile app development today with Android and iOS. Um, so why do you want to make a native app? A couple of reasons are performance, something like games, every frame counts, or even apps like Flipboard, they found the document object model isn't fast enough sometimes. Um, users tend to spend more time with apps. You have a presence on their home page. Um, you have persistent data. Um, and you have these familiar off-the-shelf UI components, and they just really hook in well with system functions like ex accessibility, for example. Uh, that's all done for you. And you have access to sensors, operating system functions, et cetera. Now, the gap is definitely closing. You'd be surprised at what type of sensors you have access to, even just in the web. Like, you have uh, light, ambient light, vibration, the camera, and mic accelerometer. But there's still some like the fingerprint and payments that just don't have web support. As far as persistence, we're actually working on something like this for our capstone, uh, a progressive web app. But that's limited to five megabytes. And it's a little bit, the uh, libraries are still immature. And on Android, there actually is a button to add to your home page, uh, like a, a bookmark. Um, and there are some things like bridging APIs, like PhoneGap, Ionic where you make a, mo a web app, and it has all these a JavaScript API with access to some of these components. But I've found sometimes those kind of over-promise and under-deliver. Like, instead of write once, uh, run anywhere, it's like write once, correct everywhere. Um, so sometimes you just want a native app. Um, and tools you use, Android Studio is based on IntelliJ. It's available anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, Xcode is only for the Mac. Um, there's three main programming languages I'm going to talk about. There's Java, and this is actually the subject of a court case right now. Um, Oracle has sued J uh, Google because the way it works is, for on a, from a pro programmer's perspective, it's exactly the same. You're programming in Java. Of course, there's some new APIs that are phone specific, but behind the scenes, it's different. And so the question is, can an API be copyrighted? And if so, is Google's re-implementation of the Java language fair use? And so far, they've decided yes, but it's still ongoing. And the way it works is different depending on how new the version of Android you have is. The older versions, instead of using a Java virtual machine, which is what the desktop version uses, that's how it's like portable everywhere, they use Dalvik, which is a mobile optimized version. And as far as Android, Lollipop, and further, um, they actually have what's called ahead of time compilation. So it's Java that's compiled to machine code and run natively. Um, and that happens when you install the app. Um, so Objective-C is the traditional language to program for iOS or even Mac, like OS X. And it was developed pretty long ago. I think uh, Steve Jobs, when he got fired from Apple, formed Next Step. And they decided to use this as the basis of their computers. Eventually, they got bought again by Apple. And Steve Jobs rose back. And it's influenced by C and Smalltalk, a famous object-oriented language. It's te technically anything that works in C works in Objective-C. Um, and people say it's verbose and archaic sometimes. Um, Swift is. The same is like a newer language with less of that legacy baggage. And you'll find a lot of features of modern program programming languages in it. Like uh, you'll notice on the next slide. And you can use it alongside Objective-C in the same project. And it's open source. So here's a bunch of features. I'm not going to go through all of them. But uh, you'll notice there's a lot of even like things you might see in ES6. Um, one really interesting one is Playgrounds, which is it's like REPL meets textbook meets notepad meets like preview your application. And you can see here, like they're executing some math code. And it's generating this sine wave over here at the bottom. So is Swift a success? Um, I'll let you figure that out. Another really important thing is memory management. Um, it's something that's evolved over time. When Originally, you had to manually manage your memory. 
And what that means is when you have an object, let's say I say x equals new object, y equals x, you have one object in memory and you have two references to that. When I say y equals null, I have one reference. Whenever you have no references left, you don't need it. So it's pretty safe to say you can get rid of that memory and reclaim it for something else. That's the concept. So there's a couple methods programmers use to manage this. Um, alloc creates a new um, object. Retain is when you want to assign an ob uh, a variable to that object, un like additionally. And copy creates a clone, leaving the original and creating another one with a reference count of one. And then release and auto-release decrement the count, uh, the reference count, and they're both very similar. Auto-release just defers a little bit, so let's say you want to return a function and then get rid of something, it will hold off until after that is returned. And dealloc is something you, sh you never call it, but you override it in classes, and it cleans up some like properties that might be there when that class is destroyed. Um, in 2011, they came out with this thing called automatic reference counting, which is a form of garbage collection based on those rules. The only method that still remains of those is alloc, and that carries over to Swift. Um, it's not perfect. You can still have things where there's like circular references to like, a parent and child, and they, you'll, it will never, you'll have a memory leak. So children should always have weak references to their parents. And there's a really cool tool to refactor stuff. Um, as far as Java, they have ga garbage cr collection, but it's a different algorithm. Uh, you basically start at the roots, the global variables, expand that out as if it's a tree, and mark every single thing you can access. Those are live objects. Then you look at your heap, which is all the objects, and any objects that aren't marked, you sweep them away. And this, doesn't, this happens when your memory is like running out. It's not something that's continuously monitored. So I'm going to build a little demo app, or rather I've built it. So this is um, iOS Objective-C. This is what you call the interface builder. And as you can see up in the right corner, that class links to a code file on the left. I don't know if that's clear enough for you, but you're dragging out interface elements. And these, you can make a static layout, and you can make it responsive. You can see you can center it on the page. And when it comes time, you can link this to code files. So right now, I'm going to make that little uh, label a property of a class. And as you can see, you can set the text dynamically. And you can change colors. You can do all of this sort of stuff. And that's what makes it really powerful. It's like the ease of use with the uh, like versatility of code. And this is completely optional. You can do everything entirely in code, but most people are going to use storyboards and interface builder. So right now I'm just setting the color of some fonts. Uh, so this is a, a little bit the next step. You can make segues between different controllers. And it's basically like a state change in Angular. And you can name those with a custom uh, identifier. Now, finally, I'm going to create a new class. By the way, if I haven't told you, this is basically like an app, like you enter in a tag and it's going to search for that on Instagram. So this is inheriting from UI collection view which controller, which is like a grid layout in iOS. They have table view, collection view, um, all these different things. You'll notice a lot of these are commonly prefixed. That's like an IG. And so I'm just going to create that code file. And see that, that um, thing on the right here? I'm going to link that to that code file, that class. So uh, this, that on the right represents that code file. And finally, you can basically import that. This is back in the first, the entry point of the app. I'm going to import that new um, view controller, which holds the grid. I'm going to capture the input from my entry point, that first, uh, the text box. And basically, I'm going to say, when you transition over, you can pass this data to the next uh, slide. And so 
On the next page, gallery.search search term is what is on this page, self.input.txt. And I just have like one more step to this. So a couple methods. You init a, a, a grid view with some options. You um, on view did load. This is just OAuth stuff. Uh, Instagram now requires like an individual user token, which it didn't used to. And then refresh, this is just grabbing the data and images and loading them asynchronously. And then these are the really important methods. You have your UI table view controller or grid view controller is actually three things. It's a grid view, it's a, what's called a grid view data source and a delegate. And dele data source methods are things like self or item at index, at index path and it's basically saying it's gonna, what's actually happening is it's loading an individual image into a cell. And it's using that, that images array we populated in the refresh method. And then what's called a delegate method is, what, is re something that responds to events. So I didn't use this, but if you wanna use did select row at index path, when someone clicks on an image, say you wanna expand it out, this is the method where you kind of take advantage of that. And just a couple differences. Swift doesn't have class and header files. You have a, a single file. On Android, you have something similar, but you can flip between that and XML, which is really handy. And you have these things called fragments on Android, which let you really easily, like, they're like containers that you can uh, reflow. So something on tablets might look different on phones, but you're using the same components. And as for publishing your app, it's a pretty similar process. You need to build and sign these files. Uh, Apple's a little bit more expensive, but you tend to get more revenue from them, uh, even though there's fewer downloads. And they both take the same cut. Um, the Apple App Store approval process used to be really long. They've really cut it down like really recently. And Google used to not do, it used to be completely computerized. And they still do that, which for like virus scans and like it speeds it up a lot, but they have added like a human review. And another cool thing about Android is you can, what's called sideload apps. So even if something's not on the app store, you can download and install it. And there's also third party app stores like Amazon, or if you're in China, like I think they have like a Baidu store. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I've published an iOS app in a 